when it comes to our lives. And in each of them, their agenda is to do us good. Um, salvation is too good to be true, but it's true. And so if you want to explore who they are with a view to developing a better appreciation of their readiness to engage with you as a Christian, then please check them out. Th this one was the first one that I wrote. My wife said to me, we don't get enough sermons on God. And then I began to think about the books that are written on God, and they tend to be very heavy in terms of weight and very heavy in terms of the contents. In fact, I'm not too sure whether they encourage us to get to know God because they often make him out to be so complex that we are frightened about getting too close to him. And of course he is complex, he's God. But I wanted to write a book that would give us a gentle journey into an exploration of who he is, and so that's why I wrote that one. But there is a booklet that relates to what we're going to be doing today, which is this one, The Remarkable Spirit. And if you want to have a little sleep when I'm talking today, then you can pick up that booklet later, and then you can read it at your leisure. There's another couple of books there on the Holy Spirit as well, as well as a few books on Jesus. So have a look, see if they're of any help to you in your developing journey with the Lord. And then there are some resources that are that are something that I have done for the past five years in helping Christians in their personal devotions to a journey with the Lord and in life groups and in other settings. Check them out, see whether they're valuable to you. Let me tell you what I want to do in our time together. I don't know what your experience of the Spirit has been or what your knowledge of the Spirit has been. I come from a Pentecostal setting. I come from a little country called Wales, which is next to England. It's a very small country, Wales. There's more sheep living in Wales than there are people. I'm one of the people. It's, uh, it's very mountainous and it rains quite a lot. But unlike Hong Kong, when it rains in Wales, it tends to be quite cold as well. But for much of my life with my wife, Judy, we've lived in England. But when I was being brought up as a young Pentecostal Christian in a very good church in South Wales, I'd heard about the Holy Spirit. Of course, I'd heard about Jesus and the Father as well. But my teaching concerning the Holy Spirit, now I look back, was very narrow. I had been told that he would give gifts, which he does, although I didn't seem to have one. And nobody else in the church seemed to have one either, so I felt a little bit relaxed about that. But that was one thing that he was supposed to do. Another thing that he was supposed to do was be, would be to tell me off when I did things wrong. And they, I thought, were the two main responsibilities of the Spirit. To give me gifts, but he wasn't overly generous, and to be there to just tell me off when I was straying from where I should be going. He does that as well. But other than that, I didn't think that the Spirit had much to do with me as a Christian, or for any other Christian for that matter, except, from, except on those occasions when he would do something a little bit special in our lives. We might have an experience of the Spirit, and, and then he'd be gone. And we might not see him or hear of him or have a relationship with him for weeks, months. I was so wrong. And when I read the New Testament, I find that the Spirit's involvement in our lives is so much more intense, more imminent, more life transforming than ever I would imagine. But for most of my upbringing as a Christian, I just wasn't aware of it. So I want us to explore some of the passages of the New Testament today where we see top of the agenda of the Spirit's involvement in our lives is to do us good. So this is going to be a time for you to relax in the presence of somebody who is on your side, the Spirit. In fact, you may wonder why he's called the Holy Spirit. You might think, well, that's an easy question. He's called the Holy Spirit because he's holy, he's perfect, he doesn't make mistakes, he doesn't have a plan B because he doesn't need a plan B because everything he does is right first time. He's holy. Well, that's true. But that's not why he's called the Holy Spirit by Luke and by Paul when they write about him. You see, here's their context. They are presenting this member of the Godhead to their readers. Now, if they are 
non-Jewish people, then they are aware of all kinds of spirits, gods, goddesses, spirits, ancestor spirits, and all of these spirits in their past life, they are aware of their supernatural power. But the one thing that is consistent about all these spirit forces in their backgrounds, be they Roman or Greek citizens, the one consistent element is that these spirits don't do you any good. They're not interested in you as an individual. You can pray to them and you can ask for help, but don't expect them to be involved in giving a response because they don't care about you. And why should they? You're just a human being. They are gods. They may be interested in you if you are the emperor or if you are a leading warrior general, somebody who is important, maybe a rich member of society, then maybe they will have some time for you. But for the ordinary people, they are not at all interested in you. In fact, if you're an ordinary member of society, such as we are, then our role would be to try and keep out of the way of these spirit forces. Try not to get them to think about us, because if they did think about us, they would probably end up doing something negative to us. So try and just keep out of their way. Give them a few little gifts in the temples when you are going down to the office, just to keep on their good side. Don't expect anything good from them. Your role is to try and ensure that they don't do anything bad to you. Now, Paul and Luke are also speaking to people in their audiences who are Jews. So they, of course, don't have the gods of the Roman and Greek citizens. They are aware of Jehovah God. But Jehovah is one God. That's for the Jewish people. There's one God. I am the Lord your God. There is no other God. So now these Christian writers have to introduce the spirit to these people. And they don't know of this other member of the Godhead. So they introduce the concept of the spirit being defined as a holy spirit. The Greek word for holy that the writers use has the meaning of different. He's a different spirit. Now, of course, he's perfect. Of course, he doesn't have to make a plan B. But fundamentally, he's a different kind of spirit to any other spirit force that's out there. How is he different? Ah, well, that's it. He's on your side. He's not just by your side. He's on your side. He's on your side to do you good. In contrast to the other spirits who are there to do negative things to you, he is on your side to do you good. That's why he's defined in the New Testament as the Holy Spirit. He's the different spirit. He's the on your side spirit. And for the Jewish readers, well, of course, their perspective of their God is that he has ignored them for the past 400 years. They haven't had any prophetic word from Jehovah for four centuries. And their assumption is that he's either forgotten us or we have upset him so badly that he has rejected us. And so when they are introducing to the Jewish people who now become Christians concerning the spirit, they want to say to them, listen, the spirit is there to remind you that you have not been rejected. You have not been forsaken. You have not been overlooked. You've not been forgotten. This spirit who is different to every other kind of spirit is on your side to do you good. I want us to explore this notion of the spirit who comes into our lives when we become Christians with an agenda. And the top of the agenda is not to give us a gift so that we can benefit others, although he might. It is not to put us right when we do things wrong, although he might be involved in that as well. His top agenda is to do good to us, to me, to you. Now, that is potentially such a presumptuous statement for me to say that I need some support. And that's why I'm going to base what I say on the Bible, because otherwise it would be just me making statements that might be forlorn and untrue unless I've got a biblical basis for what I say. So let me take you back to the first century. Jesus is with his disciples. He's been with them for a little while now, and then he says something that makes their hearts turn over and their stomachs begin to churn because he says, I'm leaving. I'm going, and, uh, and you're not going to be able to come with me. 
They are not expecting this. The disciples are expecting Jesus to establish the new kingdom in Jerusalem. That's what they've been anticipating Messiah would do. And now he says, I'm not going to be doing that. I'm leaving you. And then he gives them the best gift that he could possibly give. He says, somebody is coming in my place. And he is referring to the Spirit, to the Holy Spirit. And define, he defines the Spirit as another person. That is to say, one who is exactly the same as me, with the same quality of commitment to you, that's the same kind of one who's going to come and partner you when I have gone. In fact, the Spirit is going to be better because whereas Jesus could only be in one place at the same time, the Spirit has the capacity to be in every place at the same time and to be in each of our lives at the same time. So when Jesus says, I'm giving you another one to walk with you as I have done, he's giving the best thing that he can. And it's John's gospel that refers to this. Just a few chapters earlier, the author John refers to an occasion where Jesus has gone to a feast. It's known as the Feast of Tents or the Feast of Tabernacles and it lasts for seven days and the Jewish people, the feast takes place in Jerusalem, the Jewish people live for seven days in tents or tabernacles and they either put them on top of their houses because most people in the first century in Israel lived, if they lived in a house, it was a, a kind of a one-roomed house with a flat roof so they would put this tent on the roof or they would go into the fields and they would live in the tents and they did it to remind themselves of what it was like for their ancestors when they left Egypt and went to the promised land because the feast of tents is to remind them of the way that God looked after them during those 40 years living as nomads in the wilderness. Now during those seven days of remembrance and festival they have a special ceremony. Every day, a, some of the priests come to the Pool of Siloam, which is in the southern part of Jerusalem, just south of the Temple of Jerusalem, where the rich people live, and they take water from the Pool of Siloam, and in a musical and formal procession, they take it through the streets of Jerusalem, all the way up to the north and around, into the temple itself, and the water is poured from a golden flagon on top of the altar of sacrifice to cleanse the altar of the sacrifices that have been taking place there previous days. It takes place on every day. And then on the final day, which is called the great day, Jesus stands up and he says this. And you can read it yourself, but I will just read it to you. It's in chapter 7 of John. On the last day of this feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and proclaimed, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. He's, of course, been reminded of the water that he sees being poured out of the golden flagon onto the altar of sacrifice. And he sees that water and he says, if you come to me, everybody who comes to me and follows me, out of that person will be rivers, rivers of living water. And John in the next verse tells us that he's referring to the Spirit. Why does Jesus identify the spirit, the one who is coming to replace him, the one who is coming to live in your life. In fact, he came to live in your life the moment you became a Christian. He moved in before you even might have known he existed. You didn't need to ask him to come in. He was coming in because his determination was to partner you and to partner me from the moment we became followers of Jesus right through to the end of our lives. That was his agenda. Why is he identified as water? Well, think about it from a first century perspective. Water in the first century for a Jewish person symbolizes cleansing. And the Spirit's involvement in your life and in my life is to announce the fact that we have been cleansed, transformed, refined. The moment we become a Christian, our sins have been passed. The Spirit's presence in us is a reminder of that cleansing. But throughout our journey, the role of the Spirit is to help us 
refine ourselves in terms of our personalities and our characters. He's there to help us improve ourselves, but he's also there to improve us on his own basis. He doesn't just need us to help him to make ourselves better. He is determined to change us, to transform us, to make us like Jesus as well. He's more interested in making us like Jesus even more than I am. He's more determined to bring about that transformation. He's the one who changes us, says Paul, from glory into glory. That's his agenda. So water is indicative of this cleansing involvement of the spirit in our lives, but also Water's everywhere. 70% of this world in which we live is covered by water. And when Jesus uses the notion of water, he's trying, I suggest, to remind us that when the Spirit is involved in our lives, he completely immerses us in himself. Which makes me want to ask this question, how close is the Spirit to me? How close is the Spirit to you? And on the basis of that, what does the Spirit do in proximity to us? I don't know whether you have ever wondered, is the Spirit inside of you? Or is the Spirit here? Or is he over there? Or is he all around us? When the writers of the New Testament try and explore the relationship of us and the Spirit, it's quite interesting the way they do it, because they use different idioms to help us. So, for example, John, in his Gospel, uniquely speaks of the Holy Spirit as the parakletos. That's the Greek word that he uses. Paraklete is the word that we sometimes use in our English translations. The word is a very interesting word, and John has coined it to identify the relationship of the Spirit to us. It's no help to me knowing that he's called a paraclete, because I don't know what a paraclete is. But if I tell you what it means to the Greek readers, then it makes complete sense. Because the word is a compound word. The first part, para, means alongside of. And the second bit, kletos, means to be called. So what John is saying is that the spirit is somebody who has been called to be alongside of us. Got it, right. So what you're saying, John, is that the Spirit is going to be here. Yes, says John, that's what I'm saying. The Spirit is going to be here. And what is he going to do in this position, John? John says he's going to be your advocate. Sometimes in your translations, you may have it that he's your comforter or your counselor. He's both of those, but much better, he's your advocate. That is to say, he's on your side to defend you, to support you, to protect you, to do everything you need, and it's from the position of being alongside of us. This is why Paul picks up the same picture and speaks about us walking with the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, because it's as if he's here. But don't be misunderstood, or don't be misled, excuse me, because that doesn't do justice to the involvement of the Spirit in our lives. It's not that he's here, and that's pretty good for me. But Paul also says that the Spirit is in you. And then he also says, and you're in the Spirit. Now, uh, uh, that's contradictory to me. How can he be in me and me in him? And Paul, speaking as a first century person, would probably slap me and say, Keith, you're thinking like a 21st century person. You're being too logical, you're being too analytical, you're trying to diagnose the words that I'm using, and you have come up with this is an illogicality. And Paul says, listen, I'm trying to define something that is beyond explanation, but it demonstrates the unbelievable commitment of the Spirit to you. He's in you, and you're in him, and he's alongside of you. How close? so close that you can't help but fall on him if you were going to fall over. That's remarkable, Paul. Yes, but Paul says, that's not the point. The point is, why is he there? What is he there to do? Is he so close to us because it's from that perspective that he can see the things that we're going to do that are wrong, or just before we do them, he can tell us not to do them, or just after we've done something that is wrong that he can punish us or chastise us or give us a ticking off, off or whatever? Is that why he's so close? Well, that's not a bad thing for him to be involved in our lives for that, but that's not why he's there. He is there to constantly remind us, well, let me take you just to one verse. 
and we'll find out what it is that the Spirit is supposed to be doing in our lives, in that he constantly reminds us of one aspect. And I'm going to be looking at a verse which is in Galatians 4. And if you have your Bibles with me, you can turn to it. It's Galatians 4, verse 6. Um, but let me give you a context first before we explore this verse. Paul is writing this letter, and the people that he is writing to live in an area of modern-day Turkey, which is in the southern part of modern-day Turkey, just a little bit away from the coast. Paul has gone through Turkey from Israel because he is intending to go into Europe to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. But he can't get very far because he's got ill and he had to stop in Galatia. And in chapter 4, he gives us a hint as to something that must have happened as a result of which he can't go any further. Because he says to the people, I am so glad that you didn't despise me. Well, he actually says in the Greek, I'm so glad that you didn't spit at me. Why would they have wanted to have spat at him? Well, it looks as if something has happened to Paul that is a bit scary. And so they spit at him in order to protect themselves from the evil that must have been present in his life. Because they viewed spittle as having some kind of powerful antidote from evil. So you spit at that person and then the evil doesn't come to you. Paul says, you could have done that because you knew that I didn't look very pleasant, but you chose not to do it. I'm so grateful that you didn't. What could it have been? Well, we don't know. I'll check with him when I get to heaven, but I suspect <laughs> that it looks as if he's come through the coast of modern day Turkey. And at the time it was swampland. And at the time, as far as we can tell, malaria was very prominent and it's probable that he picked up malaria and it manifested itself in him having very bad eyes. In fact, at the end of this letter of to Galatians, he says, see with what large letters I'm writing to you because he can't write small because his eyes are so bad. Never think of Paul as being some six foot six tall man with blonde hair and blue eyes. I don't know how tall he is or what color his hair or his eyes are, but he knew what it was to live with some physical suffering. And he stops in Galatia because of this physical problem that he has. Maybe it's his thorn in the flesh that he refers to in 2 Corinthians, that he asked the Lord to take away from him and Jesus said no three times and then he stops asking because Jesus is giving him his grace to support him doing it. But it's while he stops that he preaches the gospel to these people. Now, the people that he speaks to, they're a very strange group of people. They know that they are strange. They know that they are very difficult to govern. Governors who went from Rome, they hoped that they wouldn't be offered the position of Galatia or Israel. Both of them were going to be troublesome uh, re responsibilities. And the people of Galatia were a very warlike group of people. They couldn't trace their heritage back very far. They were mongrels in terms of their lifestyle. And they are the people that Paul preaches the gospel to. And they come to faith, and they come to faith with so much baggage that's part of their pagan previous journeys. And it's to these people that Paul will introduce the Spirit to. It's probably the first letter that Paul wrote. And it's probably that Galatians is the first letter that was written in the whole of the New Testament, which is interesting because it tells me something about that which is important to Paul in terms of his preaching. Because the letter is about the role of the Spirit to be our guide, to be the one who walks with us, to be the one who makes a difference in our lifestyles. The first two chapters... Paul makes a statement as to who he is. It's a very long presentation about his credentials, and you might think it's unnecessary, but it's because of what he's going to say later that he has to remind the people who it is that's going to be speaking to them. He's an apostle, an apostle of the Lord Jesus. He's received revelations from God. He presents himself in this high presentation and then when he gets to chapter 3 and chapter 4 he says now this is why I have done that because I want you to know that the one who's saying what I'm going to be saying to you is speaking with authenticity with pedigree 
trust me. What is it that he says? Well, the verse that we're going to look at is just in verse 6, and this is what it is. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Just want us to explore this little verse together in order to appreciate something about the remarkable nature of the spirit to us as Christians. And at the same time, I hope that I'll be able to help you become first century people, which is always a good thing to do when you try and read the New Testament, because it wasn't written to us. It was written to first century people um, who had their own needs and their own questions and their own problems and their own cultures. And if I read this with a first century perspective, it'll help me better appreciate what the writer is trying to say. So he's speaking to Christians they haven't long been Christians. Their journeys up till now have been dominated by pagan activities and beliefs. They have very little that they can bring to God and say, please receive me. It's completely of the grace of God that they've been accepted. And now Paul says, the spirit has come to live in your life. Now, of course, wherever the spirit is, there is Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, there is the Father. So do not think that the Spirit lives in you while Jesus and the Father are living somewhere in heaven having endless cups of coffee, because they are not. They are just as involved in our lives as the Spirit is involved in our lives. But the presentation of the New Testament and Jesus' picture that he presents is, I'm leaving, so you won't be able to see me, but it's not that you are going to be orphans because somebody is coming to replace me. You won't be able to see him, but he's the Spirit. And he's not the third member of the Trinity. Sometimes we think like that, Father, Son, Spirit. He's like the third of three. Oh yes, he's a member of the Godhead, but he's not as good as the other two. It's not true. It's Father, Son, Spirit. They are each equal. They are each worthy of our worship, each divine, each members of the Godhead. So when the Spirit comes into our lives, he is coming representing the whole of the Godhead. What is he there to do? Well, the first thing that Paul says is um, this is the basis of his being involved in our lives. It's because you are sons. Now, Forgive Paul, because he is writing as a first century person, so he's a little patriarchal. You might think that you have to be a son to have any of the benefits from God. It's not true. So I will happily put there, because you are sons and daughters, because you are children of God, God has done something. I think Paul is interested in keeping this word sons here because of something he's going to be saying in the second line of this verse, and I'll come to that later. But fundamentally what he's saying to us is, listen, Everything that I'm going to be saying to you is on the basis of you being a child of God. Not a good child of God, necessarily. Not a perfect child of God, necessarily. Because you are a child of God, then he's going to say what the Spirit is doing in our lives. Now, when we became children of God, we had no part to play in that at all. Some of us, when we became followers of Jesus, we didn't offer very much to Jesus. And the best that we offered wouldn't have been good enough to have received what he chose to give to us because he decided to give us joint heirship with himself and son and daughtership of God the Father. We became children of God the minute we became a Christian. Shouldn't be like that. That's just, that's not fair, Lord. It's not fair because we've got so much and you've got so little. All you've got is us. Pastor René prayed in his earlier prayer about the, the benefit that, that we received when Jesus died on the cross. It wasn't much benefit to Jesus, great benefit to us. So because we're children of God, that's the basis. Paul says, God has sent the Spirit. Now, when you read God has sent the Spirit, we've got to be careful that we don't think that that means something like this. Imagine the conversation in heaven. Jesus has gone back to heaven. The Christians are on their own. Somebody has got to go be with them. Well, Jesus says, well, I, I can't go. I was there for 33 years. That was plenty long enough. And the father says, well, I can't go because I'm looking after the universe. So it has to be you, spirit. You'll have to go. But I don't want to go, says the spirit. No, you have to go. And God sent the spirit. No, no. The spirit is not the divine servant. He is not the slave in the Godhead. 
the spirit comes with the backing of the Godhead. That's the point. The point that Paul is trying to illustrate to his readers is do not think somehow that you have got an inferior member of the Godhead. You've only got the spirit. How much better would it have been if you had Jesus? Paul says, absolutely not. The spirit comes with the whole backing of the Godhead. And it's not because it's not as if he's some inferior member of the Godhead. He is a member of the Godhead. He is truly God himself. He is divine. The point that Paul is illustrating is that he has the divine backing. This is all part of God's plan. But there's something else that's quite interesting. This little word here, God has sent. In English, um, or rather in, in Greek, and of course the New Testament was written in Greek in the first place, if you are going to refer to something in the past tense, you can do it in two different ways. And maybe this reflects in some of your languages. So if I was wanting to say something like, I was traveling to church this morning, I could say it in a continuous sense, I was traveling in the car. It was an event in the past, but it took a process. Or I could say, I traveled. And the picture there is that I was at the hotel and now I'm at the church. And in the first century, in the writing of Greek, and you can use the two different ways of speaking, uh, a continuous past tense or a, a moment in time, a punctilia statement, it's happened. And when Paul uses the notion of God has sent, he is meaning the latter. He is not saying God has sent the Spirit and the Spirit has been on his way from heaven down to us and it has took years and years for him to come and he will start to come in your life and 20 years later he'll still be coming and there'll be still more of him to come and 40 years later he's not all come but he's still coming that's not what Paul is saying Paul is saying no God has sent him he has completely come point in time the moment you become a Christian the backing of the Godhead is spirit now's the time to go and take up the journey of walking with these people and the spirit comes he doesn't leave anything back in the railway station or the airport he brings all of his all of his resources with him to do us good um, oh but you notice how he's described he's described as the spirit of his son it's a very unusual description in fact in nowhere else in the New Testament is the Holy Spirit described as the spirit of his son thank you so much that's a very helpful person <laughs> it's a good metaphor for the role of the spirit to be our helper our advocate somebody who's on our side somebody who was there to do me good before I even realized that I needed it so thank you on both counts so this concept of the spirit of his son is nowhere else used by Paul or anywhere else in the New Testament, which again makes me wonder why Paul have you done that? Because remember, the writers of the New Testament are wordsmiths. They don't just idly, quickly write down their letters. They think through carefully what they're going to be saying because they are wanting to express something very special and they will do their best to write it as carefully and as meaningfully as they can. The spirit of his son. Well, he's obviously referring to the spirit who walked with Jesus, the son of God. But why does he say that the spirit who walked with Jesus is going to be the one who walks with us? I suspect it's because Paul is wanting us to realize the remarkable nature of the Spirit's commitment to us, that it is none other than the Holy Spirit who walked with Jesus who's going to walk with us from the moment we become Christians. But let's think about that. Why did the Spirit walk with Jesus? Now, the Spirit we know when Jesus was baptized comes in the presence of the dove to partner Jesus in his ministry. But please, he was with Jesus from before that fact, because the Gospel of Luke tells us that when Jesus was being born, the Spirit overshadowed the birth. So Jesus didn't just start, excuse me, the Spirit didn't just start with Jesus three years before he died. He was with Jesus right from the start of his life. But why was he there? Was it because Jesus needed some help? Well, Jesus is God. Jesus can do anything he likes. 
And it wasn't that somehow he needed, he needed the Spirit to help him, like you and I need the Spirit to help us, because he's God. And none of the healings or the exorcisms or the miracles of Jesus are ever identified in the Gospels as being occurring as a result of the Spirit's involvement in the life of Jesus. The Spirit wasn't there fundamentally to empower Jesus because Jesus as God could do anything he likes. So why else was he there? And why do I need to know that he was there? Why does Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell me that the Spirit came on Jesus when he was baptized with water and walked with him thereafter? Well, could it be that what the writers are trying to tell me and ensuring that I know is that the Spirit is in effect with Jesus because Jesus is worthy of his presence? It's not that Jesus needs to be affirmed by the Spirit. It's not that Jesus isn't quite too sure who he is and the Spirit comes and says, it's okay, you are the Son of God. No, the Spirit walks with Jesus to affirm that he is the worthy one. It's as if the Spirit says, I've never walked with anybody like this up until now, but this is not just somebody who looks like another Jew. He is not just like another Jew. He is somebody incredibly special, so special that I am going to partner him. Now that's where the miracle begins to dawn on me because the one who partners Jesus because he is worthy of his presence is the same one who partners you and who partners me and we are not worthy of his presence. We are not God. We are not the Son of God. We are not on that high level of spirituality that belongs to Jesus. You can understand the Spirit saying, I will walk with Jesus because he is there. I am not. But the Spirit nevertheless says, still, I'm going to walk with you. Really? Me? Absolutely. I'm going to walk with you. Wow. Oh, but that's not it. There's more to come. Where is the Spirit? Paul says, on this occasion, the Spirit is not just in us, but he's in our hearts. He elsewhere says that we are in the Spirit. I've already told you about Paul, uh, about John saying that he's alongside of us. And Paul elsewhere says that we are to keep in step with him. But on this occasion, uniquely, he says the Spirit is in our heart. And again, I want to say, why, Paul, are you saying that? What does it mean that he's in my heart? I'm a doctor, I'm not a medical doctor, but I know that the heart doesn't have much space in it. So where's the room for the spirit in my heart? What if I've got a small heart? Does that mean he's a bit squashed? Does it help if I'm a bigger person? I don't know. Why am I being told that the spirit is in my heart? Well, of course, Paul is using a metaphor. And it's the way that he does uh, try and help us understand some very special truths that are beyond human language. So let's think about it. What does the heart mean to a first century person? Now, I know what a, the heart means to a 21st century person. So it's our wedding anniversary in 12 days, and I know that I'll be sending Judy a, a, an anniversary card, and on it I will say something like, I love you with all my heart. And you understand what I mean by that. Because the heart for us is the place of romance, it's the place for emotions, it's the place for love and affection. Not in the first century. In fact, if I was writing something to Judy in the first century and I said, I love you with all my heart, she wouldn't understand me at all. Because to a first century person, the heart is not the place of the affections. If I want to say I love you most dearly to a first century setting, I would have to say something like, I love you with my intestines. <laughs> or I love you with all my bowels. It, it just does not work. Of course, it makes sense because when we're nervous, uh, we get uh, butterflies in our tummy. We get, it's a bit shaky. So you can understand why they would think of this as the place of emotions. And that's exactly what they did. This is the place of emotions. They wouldn't say, I love you with all my heart. They would say, I love you with my bowels, if, if they're going to say anything. <laughs> so in that case, why do you say heart, Paul? Well, first century person, the heart is the place that they think is the center of their being. The center of a person is viewed as being the heart. They've already begun to work out that the heart is of central importance to a person. 
physiologically speaking, physically speaking, and so they define that as the center of the being. We probably would speak about our mind, perhaps, or our brain as being that which dominates our, our character and our lifestyle and our personality. But for the first century person, it was the heart. Now, with that in mind, when Paul says that God has sent the same spirit who walked with Jesus, and Jesus deserved that spirit, that spirit comes and lives in where? Where does he live, Paul? Well, he's come to live in the very center of your being, Keith. The very center, that which determines your DNA, that which makes you the person you are, that which is the, the controlling part of your life, that's where he comes in. Because he doesn't want to just be an observer. He certainly doesn't watch from a distance. He wants to be centrally involved, not to dictatorially change you, but to be in the best place possible to make a positive impact on your life coming right into the center of your being. And you notice that Paul has not for one minute suggested that we have had to achieve a certain level of spirituality for this to happen. He has not suggested you have to ask him in, you have to welcome him in. He has said, God has sent him. You have no, you have no part to play in this process. You are just an observer. You certainly should take part, uh, take um, cognizance of his presence and take advantage of it. I certainly should, but it is his responsibility to come. And then the last thing he says is that the spirit who is in the very center of our being, what is he there for? Is he there to tell me off? Well, that's not what Paul says. Is he there to give me a gift? Well, Paul doesn't mention gifts of the spirit in Galatians. He'll get to that in 1 Corinthians. He says the role of the spirit in our lives is fundamentally to do you good. How does he do that? By reminding you that God truly is your father. The word Abba is just the Aramaic word for father. There's nothing special in it. <coughs> the role of the spirit is in the very center of our being, crying on our behalf, Abba, Father. R in Romans, Paul says that the spirit affirms us when we say Abba Father. So when we're just nervous that we're just being a little precocious calling God our Father, maybe because we don't feel very good or we've let the Lord down or we've sinned or we've still got some habits in our lives we can't get rid of and we struggle to cope with the notion that God is our Father. In Romans, Paul says the Spirit helps to affirm you. It's okay to say it because it's true. But here, the Spirit says it on our behalf. In other words, it's as if the Spirit is closer to us than we are to ourselves. He takes over who we are and says on our behalf, Abba, Father. That's the commitment of the Spirit to us. And at which point I'm pretty much through. But we're going to explore this a little bit more through what Paul says in his letter to Ephesians. But let me just summarize what, what I'm saying and why I'm saying it. Sometimes we're, we're a little bit unaware of the proximity of the Spirit to us. We're unaware of the commitment of the Spirit to us. We tend to think that if he speaks to us, it'll probably be on a Sunday morning, maybe in a time of worship, um, but we don't expect too much because we haven't received too much in the past. And because of this traditioning in our thinking, our assessment could be that the Spirit's involvement in our lives is not intended to be that significant, when in reality, the message of the New Testament is the Spirit's involvement in our lives is fundamentally significant from the moment we become a Christian. In fact, before we become a Christian, the Gospel of John says that the Spirit was convicting us of our sin and getting us ready to be followers of Jesus. He is that determinedly involved in our lives. Our responsibility, our privilege, is on the basis of this commitment to say, wow, I never realized, I never realized that you were that unilaterally committed to being my partner, my best friend. I'm going to take advantage of it. I want to develop a relationship with you. Not to the exclusion of Jesus, not to the exclusion of the Father, but to bring the spirit into our thinking as well because he is as i've just said a remarkable spirit but also our best friend so let me just pray father we're exploring some concepts that 
if we were left to ourselves and we revisited them, we would be a little nervous that we are being precocious and assuming that this could be true when clearly it wasn't because these are wonderful pictures that are presented to us and so I pray that you will help us to realize the truth of the Spirit's presence in our lives and his motivation and as a result of that we will be able to take advantage of his commitment to us and together walk with him throughout our days would you make it possible for us as as a result of this Lord to walk with a spring in our steps knowing that when you Jesus gave the spirit you gave someone who was truly wonderful to be our best friend thank you so much amen